Question number 21 of the Summa Theologia is on the justice and mercy of God. And as I mentioned in the last video, what's interesting to me about this question is that justice and mercy are put together in the same question because we typically think that justice and mercy are two different aspects of God, right? He's either being just or he's being merciful. But remember, God is. God is existence. Everything with God flows through his essence and it's all the same, right? The essence and the existence and the mercy and the justice. It's hard for us to understand that. Probably the most shocking thing about this question is that we're going to have four articles in this question on justice and mercy. He's going to spend two on justice, uh, one on mercy, and then one on, on both of them together in article four. But, okay, when you think of justice, you typically think of punishment, right? God, God's wrath, God's punishment, right? Or, and when you think of mercy, you think of sin. You think of the poor sinner who needs God's mercy. As far as I can tell, at least in the excerpts that I'm going to read, there's no mention of punishment and there's no mention of sin, <laughs> okay? Uh, Thomas takes a very different approach to this, and I find it very fascinating. And by the way, we are five questions away from ending the treatise on God, on the one God, and I misspoke because I mentioned previously that the Blessed Trinity is going to fall under this treatise on the one God, and actually the next treatise is on the Trinity. Okay, we're going to have a whole treatise of, I don't know, 12, 15 questions, something like that, on the Holy Trinity. So that will be next, uh, beginning with question number 27 of the Summa Theologia. All right, so Article 1 of Question 21 on the Justice and Mercy of God says whether there is justice in God. And you know there is, but this is, this is really fascinating. There are two kinds of justice. The one consists in mutual giving and receiving, as in buying and selling and other kinds of intercourse and exchange. This is called commutative justice. This does not belong to God because... There isn't any kind of equality between us and God in that we work out deals with him like we would buy a car or get a loan from a bank. OK, so that, that would be commutative justice and that, that that's not that's not God. OK, the other consists in distribution and is called distributive justice, distributive justice, whereby a ruler or a steward gives to each what his rank deserves. So the order of the universe which is seen both in effects of nature and the effects of will, show forth the justice of God. Dionysius says, We must needs see that God is truly just in seeing how he gives to all existing things what is proper to the condition of each and preserves the nature of each in the order and with the powers that properly belong to it. Okay. There's a scripture verse that Thomas quotes constantly in the Summa, Wisdom 8.1. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, God orders all things sweetly. And what this means is that God, as Dionysius just said, provides for every creature, every being, that which it needs to fulfill its end. That's what Aquinas means by justice. He doesn't mean punishment. He doesn't mean, there's an aspect of law, as we're going to see, but primarily it means providence, the ordering of the universe, the fifth proof of the existence of God, okay, the governance of the world, right? Isn't that interesting? All right, article two, whether the justice of God is truth. Truth consists in the equation of mind and thing. Now the mind, that is the cause of the thing, is related to it as its rule and measure. I love this when we're talking about truth, it's so important, especially in our culture today, that we understand how do we know if something is true. And Thomas writes already, he had a whole question, you know, on, on truth. When, therefore, things are the measure and rule of the mind, truth consists in the equation of the mind to the thing. Okay, remember I mentioned Immanuel Kant, who had the Copernican revolution in philosophy, totally turned this whole idea of how one comes to know truth on its head and that has forever changed epistemology knowledge coming to know the truth okay but okay so we 
we we our mind conforms to the world okay we we recognize the truth in things and our mind conforms to them because the god has implanted uh, himself in things because they all pre-exist in him so our whole life is one of discovery uh, discovering god through our experience of the created world right Okay, so then he says, but when the mind is the rule or measure of things, truth consists in the equation of the thing to the mind. Okay, just as the work of an artist is said to be true when it is in accordance with his art. Love the, love the comparison there. Now, as works of art are related to art, so are works of justice related to the law which they accord. Therefore, God's justice, which establishes things in the order conformable to the rule of his wisdom, which is the law of his justice, is suitably called truth. <laughs> Again, no mention of punishment. It's wisdom, justice, truth. God is justice. God is wisdom. God is truth. Okay, so there we go. Article 3, whether mercy can be attributed to God. Now, I put the image of divine mercy, and I'm a big fan of the, the whole divine mercy devotion. I pray the divine mercy every day, the chaplet. Um, but Thomas's take on mercy is very different. He says, mercy is especially to be attributed to God as seen in its effect, but not as an effect of passion. So if you have mercy on a poor sinner or a homeless person, okay, that's a passion. So Thomas is right away saying God does not have any passions because passions are changeable of the subject, right? If I get angry all of a sudden, I've changed. If I get sad, if I get happy, I've changed, okay? So the passions change me, and God doesn't change, okay? He's immutable. Hence it follows that he endeavors to dispel the misery of this other as if it were his. That is God's mercy, dispelling the misery of another. And this is the effect of mercy. Therefore, over the misery of others belongs not to God, but, but it do, does most properly belong to him to dispel that misery. Okay, no passion, no emotions in God. Now, defects are not removed expect, expect by, except by the perfection of some kind of goodness, and the primary source of goodness is God. So the dispelling of defects is through God's goodness. It must, however, be considered that to bestow perfections appertains not only to the divine goodness, but also to his justice, liberality, and mercy. All right, so there's all these things that are playing a part in the dispelling of defects. The communicating of perfections appertains to goodness, Insofar as perfections are given to things in proportion, the bestowal of them belongs to justice. And insofar as God does not bestow them for his own use, but only account on the account of his goodness. And insofar as perfections given to things by God expel defects, it belongs to mercy. All right, so mercy and justice and goodness and liberality and truth. They're all related to our good God, and only in our minds do we separate them, right? It's all one with God. All right, article number four, whether in every work of God there are mercy and justice. Now, I think the important thing about this is that we typically think, okay, God's, you know, his wrath is, is you know, laying, throwing down the justice. And, oh, oh, now he's being merciful. And, oh, now he's being just. And now he's being merciful. That's not the way it is. It's all one and the same, right? With God, God is, right? I know I'm saying that a lot, but it's very important that we understand this, right? Mercy and, okay, okay, let me, okay. Whatever is done by him in created things is done according to proper order and proportion wherein consists the idea of justice, as we already talked about. Thus, justice must exist in all God's works. Now, the, the work of divine justice always presupposes the work of, of mercy and is founded thereupon for nothing is due to creatures except for something pre-existing in them or foreknown so the mercy which is the dispelling of defects the dispelling of misery is intertwined with his justice as he orders the universe teleology fifth proof of the existence of god right so in every work of god viewed as its primary source there appears mercy in all that follows, the power of mercy remains and works indeed with even greater force. 
again, we tend to think God has mercy on the poor sinner, has mercy on us in the confessional. Mercy flows constantly, okay? And it's, it's equatable with his justice. All right, last sentences here. For this reason, God does God, out of abundance of his goodness, bestow upon creatures what is due to them more bountifully than is proportionate to their deserts, since less would suffice for preserving the order of justice than what the divine goodness confers. Because between creatures and God's goodness, there can be no proportion. So God has an overabundance of, he gives more than what we deserve. He, he gives more than what we need. And this is his justice. And this also is his mercy as well. So I hope that gave you a new perspective on justice and mercy. You know, the way it's presented in today's church is great. It's awesome. But St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, had a, a a different but similar perspective it doesn't it's not contrary to anything that we're, we're learning today about these things but it's interesting to see how the angelic doctor puts these two together as really in some way being one in the same because god is thanks for joining me for this journey through the summa of question 21 22 will be tomorrow saint thomas aquinas pray for us